Good evening, my name is Sam Lamerson. I'm the president of Knox Seminary. I know that I don't look like a president. I look like I ought to be the model for the bridge troll in Three Billy Goats Gruff, but it's my pleasure tonight to introduce the graduation speaker, but before I do that, I need to make a confession. When I was 23 or 24 years old, I used to subscribe to a cassette tape called Preaching Today. It came every month. And one month, there was a sermon on there by a man whom I'd never heard of, and he started the sermon off by telling us that Algerian existentialist philosopher Albert Camus told us that the only real question man had to answer was whether or not to commit suicide. I liked that sermon, and so I stole it and used it as my own. It belonged to Steve Brown. And so tonight, I ask his forgiveness, and I ask you to welcome him as he comes to bring the Word of God to us, the Reverend Dr. Steve Brown. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Uh, distinguished faculty and guests, and spouses and parents, and graduates. I'm flattered that I would be asked to be here tonight to celebrate with you what God has done and is doing and is going to do in your life. Let's pray. Father, as we come into your presence, we come quite aware that we are your servants and that these students have been set apart in a special and profound way to serve you and your people. Father, it's cost them and their families time and effort and sleepless nights. It's been a hard road to hoe and the hardness is just beginning. Father, bless these students. Anoint them with your spirit. Make them strong and help them not to shilly shally. And then, Father, tonight during this time and these words, forgive the one who speaks his sins, his arrogance, and his phoniness. we would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago at a faculty meeting at the seminary where I was teaching, the discussion arose about students who had gone into ministry, counseling, teaching, pastoral ministry, youth ministry, who had been chewed up by the church. They went thinking that if they would be faithful, if they would be nice, if they would teach and preach God's word, then everything would be fine, and it wasn't. And many of them were leaving the ministry altogether. And so the faculty turned to me and said, Brown, it's up to you. Do something about it. Well, I did, and the reason they picked me is because I have a mean streak, and they wanted me to give a mean streak to the students. And I did, and it irritated them. I designed a course, politics and ministry, and I talked about pockets of power and how to identify those pockets of power. I talked about how to collect chips and how to use them at the right time, who to hug and who's posterior to kick. I talked about how to win battles without losing your salvation and how to know how the vote on the session would go. And the students absolutely hated it. They would say, this is manipulative and it is not Christian. And I would say, be quiet. You will be tested on this, and the day will come when you will rise up and call me blessed. <laughs> a 
I've been doing this for a very long time and have taught thousands of students. And I want you to know that many, many of them, once they were in ministry, called me and they would say, Steve, you remember how angry I was, how upset the criticism I offered about your lectures? I just want you to know I repent. You saved my posterior. Well, they didn't say posterior, but this is a sermon and one must obey certain rules of propriety. I suspect that even this evening, some of the things that I'm going to say over the next few moments, and it will be just a few moments, will be irritating to some of you. Nevertheless, listen, think about it especially students and those of you who are going to be in ministry, but all of you, Jesus didn't die to make you nice. I was doing the Let's Get Religious week at Wheaton College a while ago, and I said to the students in, in the chapel, God didn't die to make you nice. When I sat back down after the sermon, the president leaned over and said, I thought he did. And at that moment, a student walked by and I said, son, come over here a minute. And he came over and I said, when I said, God, that Jesus didn't die to make you nice, what do you think I meant? And he said, Jesus didn't die to make me a wuss. And I turned to the president and said to him, I just, in a pedagogical way, have taught you something very important. Jesus would agree, by the way. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, and I'm going to read some of these verses, Jesus is sending out his disciples not in a way altogether different than you are being sent out. And this is what he says, these 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them saying, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the demons freely. You have received freely give, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. And then down at the 16th verse, he continues, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. And then dropping down to the 24th verse, and I'm skipping a lot of good stuff, but time requires it. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Belzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. A number of years ago, I was on the committee for the Washington for Jesus. It was a getting together of Christians from all over America who were there for only one reason, and that was to lift up Jesus. There were over a half million Christians there, and in the breakfast before the rally that was to take place on the mall in Washington, we were eating bacon and eggs and scared to death. You and I both know that if you get 500,000 Christians in one place, some of them are going to be weird. And we were worried that they were going to do something that would bring shame on the name of Christ. 
and we were also worried about how this would be received. A black African-American bishop got up, and I wish I could remember his name because I can close my eyes and see him. And he said, brothers and sisters, be quiet. I have a message for you from the Lord. And we got quiet because we were ready to hear it. And the bishop said, the Lord said for me to say to you that if you Christians get over your fear, you're going to be dangerous. I thought about that for a long time, and that's true. What does it take for a servant of Christ to be as wise as a serpent slash snake, as innocent as a dove? What does it take to be street smart? Well, first, you gotta have an attitude. Jesus says in this chapter, and I didn't read it to you, that if you go into a town and you go into a place and they don't like you and won't listen to what you say when it comes from me, shake the dust off your feet and walk away. It will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day for, than for that town or that place. What does that do for you? It tells you that you're something else and that you represent the king and you should not bow before anybody but the king. I often teach homiletics courses. And then sometimes I teach lab courses and sometimes those students are preaching for the first time. And sometimes they are scared to death. And I can't tell you how often I've told those students, before you stand up and preach, say to yourself, I'm the man. I serve the king of king. He has commissioned me with a message for you, and by God, you will listen. Students say, you can't say that. That's sinful. And I say, well, maybe, but don't repent till after the sermon. Because <laughs> you, you have an attitude. It's not an arrogant attitude. It's the attitude that comes from being commissioned by the king and representing him. When you get that, when you understand that, when you apply it to your life and you remember who you are, you're gonna be dangerous. The street smart Christian not only has an attitude, a street smart Christian has convictions. Please note what Jesus says, proclaim the kingdom. And then he says, preach it from the housetop. We're living in a country where today it is very, very scary for the servants of Jesus Christ. I have a friend who's a politician who said, you guys ought to run and hide because they're going to throw you in jail. But if they do, who's going to tell them the truth? We've got to speak the truth gently and kindly and lovingly and never with arrogance because we don't live it either but somebody's got to speak it and no matter how angry they get or upset they get don't you shilly shally you speak the truth and you will be dangerous street smart Christian is not only dangerous because he or she has an attitude, a street smart Christian is dangerous because he or she is absolutely free. Let me tell you something that maybe you haven't been told. You don't have a thing to prove. It's been proved. You don't have a thing to protect. That's why Jesus said, don't put money in your money belt. Don't take an extra coat. Just go serve and worry about them, and I'll worry about them. You don't have anything to protect. 
You don't have to pretend to be something you aren't. You are free because you are acceptable and because Jesus Christ's work on the cross is finished. And no matter where you go or the stupid things you do or the bad sermons you preach or the people you heard, you're his and you're free and you're acceptable. And, and that makes you dangerous. Then there's one other thing, and then I'm going to sit down. A street smart Christian is dangerous because he or she is valuable. I didn't read it in the text, but it's in that chapter, and I was going to read it, but I'm old and I'm doing the best I can. But Jesus said, you're of more value than all the sparrows, and even the hairs of your head are numbered. He needed to say that to his disciples when he sent them out because he knew about the discouragement, and he knew about the loneliness, and he knew about the times when you'll feel so guilty and think it's insane that you're doing what he called you to do. He knew that you would need to remember that you are highly valued in the eyes of the creator of the universe. And he thinks you are something else. There isn't a party unless you were there. I wish you could meet my father, and you will when we get home. He was a womanizer and a drunk. He did everything bad. He was a pool shark, and he was a gambler. And he never had anything to do with us because he didn't think he was good enough. And when he had three months to live, and his doctor went to his room and gave him the bad news, he said, Brownie, you have three months to live, and we're going to pray, and then I'm going to tell you something more important than what I just told you. And he told my father about Jesus. And for the first time, he got the essence of the Christian faith, that we're forgiven, that we're acceptable, that we're valuable, that we're his. You folks are going to be serving the church in one form or another. I just want you to know that 10% of the people you're going to serve are the meanest people on the face of the earth. <laughs> they'll condemn you, they'll talk about you, and they'll try to cut your legs off. That was a pastor who said, yes, yes. <laughs> there was never anything wrong with my church that I couldn't fix with a few funerals. But listen to me, 90% of the people of God are kind and generous and loving, and they'll pray for you, and they'll love you. If you minister to the 10%, you'll get regular raises. You won't have any problems. There won't be any division. And then you'll get old, and you'll retire to an old preacher's home, and you'll die. And, and on your deathbed, you'll think, I should have. If you reach out and you love deeply and profoundly, not only the 10%, but the 90%, you'll go through hell. There'll be anger, there'll be division. You won't make the money you could make, but I'll tell you something, you'll see the church become the church. And you'll see the church rise up in our culture and make a difference. And you'll see the church being a soft place for you and for your people. Last week, Wayne Graham, who was working on his PhD at Southwestern, wanted to talk to me. He, knew that I had known, and he was my dear friend, Jack Miller, the founder of uh, World Harvest and the Sunship Seminars, 
who's literally touched the world. It was Jack who taught me that all of Scripture had two, two main themes. First, cheer up, you're a lot worse than you think you are. And secondly, cheer up, God's grace is a lot bigger than you think it is. A lot of people were angry at Jack. They made fun of him, they called him names, even wrote books about him to put him down. And Wayne and I were telling stories about Jack and Wayne said, I was talking to Claire Davis, uh, the professor at Westminster last week. Let me tell you what he said about Jack. He used to go to New Life Church where Jack was the pastor and he said he was preaching one Sunday morning and he stopped in the middle of the sermon. And we thought he had lost his place, forgotten his notes, and didn't know what to say. And then he bowed his head. And then in the silence, he looked up at his people and he began to weep. And he said to them, have I ever told you how very much I love you? Claire said he never saw a preacher do that before. And if you want to know why God used Jack, you know that he was loved. And because he was, he loved God's people. You can't love until you've been loved. And then you can only love to the degree to which you have been loved. So wave your degree in the nose of the people who thought you'd never be here. <laughs> be proud. God allows that for one day. Rejoice in what God has done by being faithful to you. And then run to him and for God's sake, let him love you. So you can love them. You think about that. Amen.